Section 25 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Easton. Library of the World's Best Literature ancient and modern volume two section twenty five essay on arabic literature by richard gotthail of no civilization is the complexion of its literary remains so characteristic of its varying fortunes as is that of the arabic the precarious conditions of desert life and of the tent the more certain existence in settled habitations, the grandeur of empire acquired in a short period of enthusiastic rapture, the softening influence of luxury and unwonted riches, are so faithfully portrayed in the literature of the Arabs as to give us a picture of the spiritual life of the people which no mere massing of facts can ever give well aware of this themselves the arabs at an early date commenced the collection and preservation of their old literary monuments with a care and a studious concern which must excite within us a feeling of wonder for the material side of life must have made a strong appeal to these people when they came forth from their desert homes pride in their own doings pride in their own past must have spurred them on yet an ardent feeling for the beautiful in speech is evident from the beginning of their history the first knowledge that we have of the tribes scattered up and down the deserts and oases of the arabian peninsula comes to us in the verses of their poets the early teuton bards the rhapsodists of greece were not listened to with more rapt attention than was the simple Bedouin, who, seated on his mat or at the door of his tent, gave vent to his feelings of joy or sorrow in such a manner as nature had gifted him. As are the ballads for Scottish history, so are the verses of these untutored bards the record of the life in which they played no mean part nor could the splendors of court life at damascus baghdad or cordova make their rulers insensible to the charms of poetry that quote, beautiful poetry with which allah has adorned the muslim end quote. a verse happily said could always charm a satire well pointed could always incite and the true Arab of today will listen to those so adorned with the same rapt attention as did his fathers of long ago. This gift of the desert, otherwise so sparing of its favors, has not failed to leave its impression upon the whole Arabic literature. Though it has produced some prose writers of value, writing as an art to charm and to please, has always sought the measured cadence of poetry, or the unmeasured symmetry of rhymed prose. Its first lispings are in the, quote, trembling rajah's meter, iambics rhyming in the same syllable throughout. Impromptu verses in which the poet expressed the feelings of the moment, a measure which the Arabs say matches the trembling trot of the she-camel. It is simple in its character, coming so near to rhymed prose, that Khalil, born 718, the great grammarian, would not willingly admit that such lines could really be called poetry. Some of these verses go back to the 4th and 5th centuries of our era, but a growing sense of the poet's art was incompatible with so simple a measure and a hundred years before the appearance of the prophet many of the canonical sixteen meters were already in vogue even the later complete poems bear the stamp of their origin in the loose connection with which the different parts stand to each other 
the quote kasida poem is built upon the principle that each verse must be complete in itself there being no stanzas and separable from the context which has made interpolations and omissions in the older poems a matter of ease the classical period of arabic poetry which reaches from the beginning of the sixth century to the beginning of the eighth is dominated by this form of the qasida tradition refers its origin to one al muhail ibn rabia of the tribe of taglib about one hundred and fifty years before muhammad though as is usual this honor is not uncontested the qasida is composed of distichs the first two of which only are to rhyme though every line must end in the same syllable it must have at least seven or ten verses and may reach up to one hundred or over in nearly every case it deals with a tribe or a single person the poet himself or a friend and may be either a panegyric a satire an elegy or a eulogy that which it is the aim of the poet to bring out comes last the greater part of the poem being of the nature of a captatio benevolentia here he can show his full power of expression he usually commences with the description of a deserted camping ground where he sees the traces of his beloved he then adds the erotic part and describes at length his deeds of valor in the chase or in war in order then to lead over to the real object he has in view because of this disposition of the material which is used by the greater poets of this time the general form of the qasida became in a measure stereotyped no poem was considered perfect unless molded in this form arabic poetry is thus entirely lyrical there was too little among these tribes of the common national life which forms the basis for the epos the semitic genius is too subjective and has never gotten beyond the first rude attempts at dramatic composition even in its lyrics arabic poetry is still more subjective than the hebrew of the bible it falls generally into the form of an allocution even where it is descriptive it is the poet who speaks and his personality pervades the whole poem he describes nature as he finds it with little of the imaginative Quote, in dim grand outlines of a picture which must be filled up by the reader guided only by a few glorious touches powerfully standing out End quote. A native quickness of apprehension and intense feeling nurtured this poetic sentiment among the Arabs. The continuous enmity among the various tribes produced a sort of knight errantry which gave material to the poet, and the richness of his language put a tongue in his mouth which could voice forth the finest shades of description or sentiment. Aldamari has wisely said, quote, wisdom has alighted upon three things the brain of the franks the hands of the chinese and the tongues of the arabs End quote. the horizon which bounded the arab poet's view was not far drawn out he describes the scenes of his desert life the sand dunes the camel antelope wild ass and gazelle his bow and arrow and his sword his loved one torn from him by the sudden striking of the tents and departure of her tribe the virtues which he sings are those in which he glories quote, love of freedom independence in thought and action truthfulness largeness of heart generosity and hospitality End quote his descriptions breathe the freshness of his outdoor life and bring us close to nature his whole tone rings out a solemn note 
which is even in his lighter moments grave and serious as existence itself was for those sons of the desert who had no settled habitation and who more than any one depended upon the bounty of allah although these casitas passed rapidly from mouth to mouth little would have been preserved for us had there not been a class of men who led on some by desire some by necessity made it their business to write down the compositions and to keep fresh in their memory the very pronunciation of each word every poet had such a rawia of one hamad it is said that he could recite one hundred kasidas rhyming on each letter of the alphabet each kasida having at least one hundred verses abu taman eight o five the author of the hamasa is reported to have known by heart fourteen thousand pieces of the meter rajas it was not however until the end of the first century of the hijra that systematic collections of this older literature were commenced it was this very hamad died seven seventy seven who put together seven of the choicest poems of the early arabs he called them mu al kalat quote, the hung up in a place of honor in the estimation of the people the authors of these seven poems were imr al kais tarafa zuhair labid five seventy antara amr and al harit the common verdict of their countrymen has praised the choice made by hamad the seven remained the great models to which later poets aspired in description of love those of imr al kais and antara in that of the camel and the horse labid of battle amr in the praise of arms harit in wise maxims zuhir to these must be added al nabiha al kama urwa ibn al ward hasan ibn tabit al asha aus ibn hayar and ashad fara whose poem has been called quote, the most magnificent of old arabic poems end quote. in addition to the single poems found in the mu'akalat and elsewhere nearly all of these composed whole series of poems which were at a later time put in the form of collections and called diwans some of these poets have left us as many as four hundred verses such collections were made by grammarians and antiquarians of a later age in addition to the collections made around the name of a single poet others were made fashioned upon a different principle the mufadaliyat the most excellent poems put together by al mufadl seven sixty one the diwan of the poets of the tribe of Khudrail, the kamasa bravery so called from the subject of the first of the ten books into which the collection is divided of abu taman the best anthology of these poems is the great book of songs put together by abu al farai al ispa khani died 967 with these poets arabic literature reached its highest development they are the true expression of the free arabic spirit most of them lived before or during the time of the appearance of muhammad his coming produced a great change in the life of the simple bedouins though they could not be called heathen their religion expressed itself in the simple feeling of dependence upon higher powers without attempting to bring this faith into a close connection with their daily life mohammed introduced a system into which he tried to mould all things he wished to unite the scattered tribes to one only purpose he was thus cutting away that untrammelled spirit 
and that free life which had been the making of arabic poetry he knew this well he knew also the power the poets had over the people his own quran was but a poor substitute for the elegant verses of his opponents imr al kais he said is the finest of all poets and their leader into everlasting fire on another occasion he is reported to have called out verily a belly full of matter is better than a belly full of poetry even when citing verses he quoted them in such a manner as to destroy the meter abu bekr very properly remarked truly god said in the koran we have not taught him poetry and it suits him not in thus decrying the poets of quote, barbarism and in setting up the koran as the greatest production of arabic genius muhammad was turning the national poetry to its decline happily his immediate successors were unable or unwilling to follow him strictly ali himself his son-in-law is said to have been a poet nor did the umayyad caliphs of damascus very heathens in their carnal part bring the new spirit to its full bloom as did the abbasids of baghdad and yet the old spirit was gradually losing ground the consolidation of the empire brought greater security the riches of persia and syria produced new types of men the centre of arab life was now in the city with all its trammels its forced politeness its herding together the simplicity which characterized the early caliphs was going in its place was come a court court life court manners court poets the love of poetry was still there but the poet of the tent had become the poet of the house and the palace like those troubadours who had become jongleurs they lived upon the crumbs which fell from the table of princes such crumbs were often not to be despised many a time and oft the bard tuned his lyre merely for the price of his services we know that he was richly rewarded harun gave a dress worth four hundred thousand pieces of gold to jaafar ibn yahya at his death ibn ubaid al bukhtari eight sixty five left one hundred complete suits of dress two hundred shirts and five hundred turbans all of which had been given him for his poems the freshness of olden times was fading little by little the earnestness of the bedouin poet was making way for a lightness of heart in this intermediate period few were born so happily and yet so imbued with the new spirit as was umr ibn rabia six forty four quote, the man of pleasure as well as the man of literature end quote. of rich parentage gifted with a love of song which moved him to speak in verses he was able to keep himself far from both prince and palace he was of the family of Quraysh, in whose muhammad all the glories of arabia had centred with one exception the gift of poetry and now quote, this don juan of mecca this obed of arabia end quote, was to wipe away that stain he was the arabian minnesinger whom friedrich rückert called quote, the greatest love poet the arabs have produced end quote. a man of the city the desert had no attractions for him but he sang of love as he made love with utter disregard of holy place or high station in an erotic strain strange to the stern umayyads no wonder they warned their children against reading his compositions the greatest sin committed against allah are the poems of umar ibn rabia they said with the rise of the abbasids seven fifty that quote, god favored dynasty end quote, 
Arabic literature entered upon its second great development, a development which may be distinguished from that of the Umayyads, which was Arabian, as, in very truth, Mohammedan. With Baghdad as the capital, it was rather the non-Arabic Persians who held aloft the torch than the Arabs descended from Quraysh. It was a bold move, this attempt to weld the old Persian civilization with the new Mohammedan, yet so great was the power of the new faith that it succeeded. The Barmecid Majordomo ably seconded his Abbasid master. The glory of both rests upon the interest they took in art, literature, and science. The Arab came in contact with a new world. Under Mansur, 754, Harun al-Rashid, 786, and Mamun, 813, the wisdom of the Greeks in philosophy and science, the charms of Persia and India in wit and satire, were opened up to enlightened eyes. Upon all of these, whatever their nationality, Islam had imposed the Arab tongue, pride in the faith and in its early history. Quran, exegesis, philosophy, law, history, and science were cultivated under the very eyes and at the bidding of the palace. And at least for several centuries, Europe was indebted to the culture of Baghdad for what it knew of mathematics, astronomy, and philosophy. The Arab muse profited with the rest of this revival. History and philosophy as a study demanded a close acquaintance with the products of early Arab genius. The great philologian Al-Asmai, 740-831, collected the songs and tales of the heroic age, and a little later with other than philological ends in view, Abu Thaman and al Bukhturi, eight sixteen to nine thirteen, made the first anthologies of the old Arabic literatures, Hamasa. Poetry was already cultivated, and amid the hundreds of wits, poets, and singers who thronged the entrance to the court, there are many who claim real poetic genius. Among them are al Akhtal, died seven thirteen, a Christian. Umar ibn Rabia, died seven twenty eight. Harir al Farazak, died seven twenty eight. And Muslim ibn al Walid, died eight twenty eight. But it is rather the Persian spirit which rules the spirit of the Shanema and Firdausi. Quote, Charming elegance, servile court flattery, and graceful wit. End quote. In none are the characteristics so manifest as in Abu Nuas, 762 to 819, the poet laureate of Harun, the Imr al Qais of his time. His themes are wine and love. Everything else he casts to the wind, and like his modern counterpart, Heine, he drives the wit of his satire deep into the holiest feelings of his people. I would that all which religion and law forbids were permitted me, and, if I had only two years to live, that God would change me into a dog at the temple in Mecca, so that I might bite every pilgrim in the lake, he is reported to have said. When he himself did once make the required pilgrimage, he did so in order to carry his loves up to the very walls of the sacred house. Quote, jovial, adventure-loving, devil-maker, end quote, irreligious in all he did, yet neither the caliph nor the whole Mohammedan world were incensed. In spite of all, they petted him and pronounced his wine songs the finest ever written. Full of thought and replete with pictures, rich in language and true to every touch of nature. There are no poems on wine equal to my own, and to my amatory compositions all others must yield. 
he himself has said he was poor and had to live by his talents but wherever he went he was richly rewarded he was content only to be able to live in shameless revelry and to sing as he lived so he died in a half-drunken group cut to pieces by those who thought themselves offended by his lampoons at the other end of the muslim world the star of the umayyads which had set at damascus rose again at cordova the union of two civilizations indo-germanic and semitic was as advantageous in the west as in the east the influence of the spirit of learning which reigned at baghdad reached over to spain and the two dynasties vied with each other in the patronage of all that was beautiful in literature and learned in science poetry was cultivated and poets cherished with a like regard the spanish innate love of the muse joined hands with that of the arabic it was the same kind of poetry in umayyad spain as in abbasid baghdad poetry of the city and of the palace but another element was added here the western love for the softer beauties of nature and for their expression in finely worked out mosaics and in graceful descriptions it is this that brings the spanish arabic poetry nearer to us than the more splendid and glittering verses of the abbasids or the cruder and less polished lines of the first mohammedans the amount of poetry thus composed in arab spain may be gauged by the fact that an anthology made during the first half of the tenth century by ibn farai contained twenty thousand verses cordova under abd al rahman the third and hakim the second was the counterpart of baghdad under harun quote, the most learned prince that ever lived end quote. hakim was so renowned a patron of literature that learned men wandered to him from all over the arab empire he collected a library of four hundred thousand volumes which had been gathered together by his agents in egypt syria and persia the catalogue of which filled forty-four volumes in cordova he founded a university and twenty-seven free schools what wonder that all the sciences tradition theology jurisprudence and especially history and geography flourished during his reign of the poets of this period there may be mentioned said ibn yudi the pattern of the knight of those days the poet loved of women yahya ibn hakam the gazelle ahmad ibn abdrabi the author of a commonplace book ibn abdun of baydis ibn hafaya of khukar ibn said of granada kings added a new jewel to their crown and took an honored place among the bards as abid al-rahman the first and mutamid died ten ninety five the last king of seville whose unfortunate life he himself has pictured in most beautiful elegies although the short revival under the almohades eleven eighty four to eleven ninety eight produced such men as ibn rushd the commentator on aristotle and ibn tofel who wrote the first robinson crusoe story the sun was already setting when ferdinand burned the books which had been so laboriously collected the dying flame of arab culture in spain went out during the third period from mamun eight thirteen under whom the turkish bodyguards began to wield their baneful influence until the break-up of the abbasid empire in twelve fifty eight there are many names but few real poets to be mentioned the arab spirit had spent itself and the mogul cloud was on the horizon there were abdallah ibn al-mutaz died nine o eight 
Abu Firas, died 967. Al Tugray, died 1120. Al Busiri, died 1279. Author of the Burda poem in praise of Muhammad, but al mutanabi died nine sixty five alone deserves special mention the quote, prophet pretender end quote, for such his name signifies has been called by von Hama the greatest arabian poet and there is no doubt that his diwan with its two hundred and eighty nine poems was and is widely read in the east but it is only a depraved taste that can prefer such an epigene to the fresh desert music of Imr al Kais. Panegyrics, songs of war and of bloodshed, are mostly the themes that he dilates upon. He was in the service of Saif al Dawla of Syria and sang his victories over the Byzantine Kaiser. He is the true type of the prince's poet withal the taste for poetic composition grew though it produced a smaller number of great poets but it also usurped for itself fields which belong to entirely different literary forms grammar lexicography philosophy and theology were expounded in verse but the verse was formal stiff and unnatural poetic composition became a tour de force this is nowhere better seen than in that species of composition which appeared for the first time in the eleventh century and which so pleased and charmed a degenerate age as to make of the makamat the most favorite reading ahmad abu fadl al mahdani the wonder of all time end quote, died one thousand seven composed the first of such sessions of his four hundred only a few have come down to our time abu muhammad al hariri ten thirty to eleven twenty one of basra is certainly the one who made this species of literature popular he has been closely imitated in hebrew by harisi twelve eighteen and in syriac by ebed yeshu 1290. Makama means the place where one stands, where assemblies are held, then the discourse is delivered or conversations held in such an assembly. The word is used here especially to denote a series of quote, discourses and conversations composed in a highly finished and ornamental style and solely for the purpose of exhibiting various kinds of eloquence and exemplifying the rules of grammar rhetoric and poetry end quote. hariri himself speaks of these makamat which contain serious language and lightsome and combine refinement with dignity of style and brilliancies with jewels of eloquence and beauties of literature with its rarities besides quotations from the quran wherewith i adorn them and choice metaphors and arab proverbs that i interspersed and literary elegancies and grammatical riddles and decisions upon ambiguous legal questions and original improvisations in highly wrought orations and plaintive discourses as well as jocose witticisms the design is thus purely literary the fifty quote, sessions of hariri which are written in rhymed prose interspersed with poetry contain oratorical poetical moral ecomiastic and satirical discourses which only the merest thread holds together each makama is a unit and has no necessary connection with that which follows the thread which so loosely binds them together is the delineation of the character of abu zayd the hero in his own words he is one of those wandering minstrels and happy improvisers whom the favour of princes has turned into poetizing beggars in each makama is related some ruse by means of which abu zayd 
because of his wonderful gift of speech either persuades or forces those whom he meets to pay for his sustenance and furnish the means for his debauches not the least of those thus ensnared is his great admirer harith ibn hamam the narrator of the whole who is none other than hariri wearied at last with his life of travel debauch and deception abu zaid retires to his native city and becomes an ascetic thus to atone in a measure for his past sins the whole might be called not improperly a tale a novel but the intention of the poet is to show forth the richness and variety of the arabic language and his own power over this great mass brings the descriptive one might almost say the lexicographic side too much to the front a poem that can be read either backward or forward or which contains all the words in the language beginning with a certain letter may be a wonderful mosaic but is nothing more the merit of hariri lies just in this that working in such cramped quarters with such intent and design continually guiding his pen he has often really done more he has produced rhymed prose and verses which are certainly elegant in diction and elevated in tone such tales as these told as an exercise of linguistic gymnastics must not blind us to the presence of real tales told for their own sake arabic literature has been very prolific in these they lightened the graver subjects discussed in the tent philosophy religion and grammar and they furnished entertainment for the more boisterous assemblies in the coffee-houses and around the bowl for the arab is an inveterate story-teller and in nearly all the prose that he writes this character of the teller shimmers clearly through the work of the writer he is an elegant narrator not only does he intersperse verses and lines more frequently than our own taste would license by nature he easily falls into the half-hearted poetry of rhymed prose for which the rich assonances of his language predispose his own learning was further cultivated by his early contact with persian literature through which the fable and the wisdom of india spoken from the mouths of dumb animals reached him in this more frivolous form of inculcating wisdom the prophet scented danger to his straight-laced demands men who bring sportive legends to lead astray from god's path without knowledge and to make a jest of it for such is shameful woe is written in the thirty-first surah in vain for in hours of relaxation such works as the fables of bidpal translated from the persian in seven fifty by abd allah ibn mukaffa the ten viziers the seven wise masters etc proved to be food too palatable nor were the arabs wanting in their own peculiar romances influenced only in some portion of the setting by persian ideas such were the story of saif ibn di yasan the tale of al sir the romance of dalma and especially the romance of antar and the thousand nights and a night the last two romances are excellent commentaries on arab life at its dawn and at its fullness among the roving chiefs of the desert and the homes of revelry in baghdad as the rough-hewn poetry of imr al qais and zuhair is a clearer exponent of the real arab mind roving at its own suggestion than the more perfect and softer lines of a mutanabi so is the romance of antar the full expression of real arab hero-worship and even in the cities of the orient to-day the loungers in their cups can never weary of following the exploits of this black son of the desert who in his person 
unites the great virtues of his people magnanimity and bravery with the gift of poetic speech its tone is elevated its coarseness has as its origin the outspokenness of unvarnished man it does not peep through the thin veneer of licentious suggestiveness it is never trivial even in its long and wearisome descriptions in its ever recurring outbursts of love its language suits its thought choice and educated and not descending as in the nights to the common expressions of ordinary speech in this it resembles the makamat of hariri though much less artificial and more enjoyable it is the arabic romance of chivalry and may not have been without influence on the spread of the romance of medieval europe for though its central figure is a hero of pre-islamic times it was put together by the learned philologian al asmai in the days of harun the just at the time when charlemagne was ruling in europe there exist in arabic literature very few romances of the length of antar though the arab delights to hear and to recount tales his tales are generally short and pithy it is in this shorter form that he delights to inculcate principles of morality and norms of character he is most adroit at repartee and at pungent replies he has a way of stating principles which delights while it instructs the anecdote is at home in the east many a favor is gained many a punishment averted by a quick answer and a felicitously turned expression such anecdotes exist as popular traditions in very large numbers and he receives much consideration whose mind is well stocked with them collections of anecdotes have been put to writing from time to time those dealing with the early history of the caliphate are among the best prose that the arabs have produced for pure prose was never greatly cultivated the literature dealing with their own history or with the geography and culture of the nations with which they came in contact is very large and as a record of facts is most important ibn hisham died seven sixty seven wakidi died eight twenty two tabari eight thirty eight to nine twenty three masudi died nine fifty seven Ibn Atir died 1233. Ibn Khaldun died 1406. Makrisi died 1442. Suyuti died 1505. And Makari died 1631. Are only a few of those who have given us large and comprehensive histories. Albiruni died. 1038 writer mathematician and traveler has left us an account of the india of his day which has earned for him the title of herodotus of india though for careful observation and faithful presentation he stands far above the writer with whose name he is adorned but nearly all of these historical writers are mere chronologists dry and wearisome to the general reader it is only in the preface or exordium often the most elaborate part of the whole book viewed from a rhetorical standpoint that they attempt to rise above mere incidents and strive after literary form besides the regard in which anecdotes are held it is considered a mark of education to insert in one speech as often as possible a familiar saying a proverb a bon mot these are largely used in the moral addresses kutba made in the mosque or elsewhere addresses which take on also the form of rhymed prose a famous collection of such sayings 
is attributed to ali the fourth successor of muhammad in these the whole power of the arab for subtle distinctions in matters of worldly wisdom and the truly religious feeling of the east are clearly manifested the propensity of the arab mind for the tale and the anecdote has had a wider influence in shaping the religious and legal development of mohammedanism than would appear at first sight the quran might well suffice as a directive code for a small body of men whose daily life was simple and whose organization was of the crudest kind but even muhammad in his own later days was called on to supplement the written word by the spoken to interpret such parts of his book as were unintelligible to reconcile conflicting statements and to fit the older legislation to changed circumstances as the religious head of the community his dictum became law and these logia of the prophet were handed around and handed down as the unwritten law by which his lieutenants were to be guided in matters not only religious but also legal for law to them was part and parcel of religion this hadith grew apace until in the third century of the hijra it was put to writing nothing bears weight which has not the stamp of muhammad's authority as reported by his near surroundings and his friends in such a mass of tradition great care is taken to separate the chaff from the wheat the chain of tradition is not must be given for each tradition for each anecdote but the friends of the prophet are said to have numbered seven thousand five hundred and it has not been easy to keep out fraud and deception the subjects treated are most varied sometimes even trivial but dealing usually with recondite questions of law and morals three great collections of the hadith have been made by al bukhari eight sixty nine muslim eight seventy four and al tirmidhi eight ninety two the first two only are considered canonical from these are derived the three great systems of jurisprudence which to this day hold good in the mohammedan world the best presentation of the characteristics of arabic poetry is by w albart über poesie und poetik der araber gotha 1856 of arabic meters by g w freitag darstellung der arabischen verkunst bonn 1830 translations of arabic poetry have been published by j d carlyle specimens of arabic poetry cambridge 1796 w a clauston arabic poetry glasgow 1881 c j lyle translations of ancient arabic poetry london 1885 the history of arabic literature is given in theodor nuldecker's beiträge zur kenntnis der poesie der alten araber hannover 1864 and f f arbuthnot's arabic authors london 1890 end of section 25 recording by eva easton slotesburg new york june 2011.